はい、お待たせいたしました。えっ、ー、と、皆さん改めましておはようございます。Good morning, everyone。パイコン APAC2023 レイツオープニング始まります。And we... Uh, yeah, we'll begin day two opening of PyCon APAC 2023. My name is Jonas, I'll be your interpreter today. And yeah,、uh, for those who come back,、uh, we're here yesterday, welcome back. And those who only join us today, welcome to PyCon APAC 2023. はいえー、と昨日来た方もいらっしゃいますが、カンファレンスは、えー、と2日です。今、えーと、今回のスケジュールをご案内いたします。えー、今回は、えー、カンファレンス2日間、1日、えー、と29日はスプリントで開発、えー、開発デ,デ,ベデベロッパー、えー、スプリントというものがありまして、そちらが行われます。And yet, today is day two of the conference, but it's not the last day because tomorrow we still have the sprint day, which we will announce more information on shortly. もうちょっとクローズドでお話ししたいという方向けに、スラックパイコン JP フェローというものを準備しております。そちらは、えー、と今、スマホとフォン、今お、お手元にお持ちでしたら、こちらの QR コードをお読みいただくと、そちらのスラックに入ることができまして、そこで、その中のチャンネルですね、お部屋がありまして、そこの APAC-2023、またはイングリッシュチャンネルにて、このお話が、まあ、ある程度少しクローズドな。感じでお話しすることができますので、ぜひご活用ください。Yeah. Uh, we hope that you all、um, share your exciting moments at PyCon APAC、uh, on all kinds of social medias, no matter what their names are. And if you do so, please use the hashtag PyCon APAC as it's written on the slide. And we also prepared a Slack that you can join freely、uh, called PyCon JP Fellow. You can join it from this QR code. And there's an APAC 2023 channel there, and there's also an English channel for English speakers. はい、続きまして、えー、とソーシャルメディア、えー、と SNS 等でハッシュタグを使う際に一応こちら、えー、と定めております。昨日ちょっと間違いがあったんですが今回は直しております。えー、こちらの今いる場所がウエスト5ですね。この場所は。えー、が、えー、とトラック1となっております。ちょっと順番あの部屋の場所とトラックの名前の順番がちょっと逆になっている感じがしますが、えー、とハッシュタグはこのような形で、えー、ぜひ。活用してえちょっとちょっとさらに間違ってるすいません APAC で、ね、あ<笑>すいませんさらに間違っておりましたえっ、ー、とパイコン APAC ですここが<笑>ちょっとすいませんあのごめんなさい昨日も間違ってきまし訳えっ、ー、とすいませんさっきの一個前の方がパイコン A シャープパイコン APAC が正しいです。And yeah, on the slide that I just、uh, hit now, because it was wrong, we, co-、uh, we didn't correct it from last year. I did, we did correct the room names, but we didn't correct the hashtag. The hashtags are actually quite easy. Track one is hashtag one, track two is hashtag two, and so on. And I think it's also written here in front of the podium. Anyway,、uh, yeah, in the, in the good tradition of PyCon APEC, we get that slide wrong every day. Sorry, I'm wrong. 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 ハッシュタグ書いてありますのでここを活用くださいはいすいません申し訳ございませんでした間違いはい続きましてえっ、ー、とスポンサーのえっ、ー、とご紹介になります、uh, next、uh, we'll introduce our lovely sponsors はい、えー、今回、えー、パイコンエンパックはたくさんのスポンサーさんに支えられて運営ができております、えー、まず最初にダイヤモンドスポンサーさんをご紹介いたします、えー、こちらにありますように Google クラウドジャパン合同会社さん
いやありがとうございます。拍手。<笑> It's early in the morning. Sorry. はいありがとうございます。続きましてプラチナスポンサーさんです。えー、続けてあの読み上げてまいります。えー、変化株式会社さん。株式会社架橋さん、ファインディ株式会社さん、はい、以上の3社です。ありがとうございます。また、特別枠として、Python ソフトウェアファウンデーションさんにも協賛いただいております。ええーとですね、別の昨日ツイートでありまして、PSF とも呼んでおります。PC、PSF イコール Python ソフトウェアファウンデーションさんです。こちらは遠方支援の、えー、し補助などに使わせていただいています。ありがとうございます。And a special thank you to the PSF for supporting us very strongly this year, allowing us、uh, to have a more diverse、uh, conference and allowing more people to travel here from abroad. はい、続きましてゴールドスポンサーさんの紹介となります、えー、続いて読み上げてまいります株式会社フラットセキュリティさん株式会社ちょっと数が多いのでちょっとあのまとめてすみません、えー、とじゃあ一応また最初からいきません、えー、株式会社フラットセキュリティさん株式会社ハイヤールさん株式会社ビープラウドさん株式会社アーバン X テクノロジーズさん、一般社団法人、パイソンエンジニア推進あ育成推進協会さん、続きまして、あっ、はい、はい、前半の3分の1の、えはい、こちらの工場ソフさんです。続きまして、えー、セーフィー株式会社さん、株式会社博報堂テクノロジーズさん、株式会社グルーブズさん、サークル CI 合同会社さん、株式会社ヘルプフィールさん、はい、ありがとうございます。続きまして、えー、またゴールドスポンサーさんとなります、えー、ニューレリック株式会社さん、株式会社グローバルウェイさん、株式会社ホカンさん、オクタさん、以上がゴールドスポンサーとなります。ありがとうございます。続きまして、シルボーシルバースポンサーさんのご紹介となります。えー、こちら、えー、18社さんから、えー、ご協賛いただいております、えー。こちらもまた皆さんおは拍手をお願いいたします。続きまして、えー、とス,ペスペシャルスポンサーさんのご紹介です。こちらは、えー、スタッフの方で通信環境のサポートとか、会場の準備の会場を提供していただいたりとか、広告のサポートを行っていただいております。こちらの4社さんです。ありがとうございます。Yeah. These four sponsors helped、um, during the organization,、uh, during the planning and organizing of the event and also promoting it. 続きまして、パトロンスポンサーさんのパトロンのご紹介となります。こちら、個人の参加者の中で、サポートという意味で、スポンサーという意味も含めまして、サポートいただいている方々がこちらとなっております。こちらは、入り口、ホワイト中心部分ですね、そちらにパトロンスポンサー、パトロンの方々をこう一覧にしたポスターもありますので、ぜひこちらもご確認ください。ありがとうございます。Uh, these patrons that you see here on the slide、um, are individuals, not companies, who decide to generously、uh, support this event, and we thank them very much. There's also a banner near the entrance、uh, where you can see their、uh, names and pictures, and so you can, I don't know, stamp a picture of it. はい、以上がスポンサーさん、パトロンの皆様のご協力によって、このカンファレンスが成り立っております。ありがとうございます。Yes,、uh, we would like to thank、uh, very much our sponsors without whom we could not make this event.、はい続きまして重要こちらのご重要な案内となります。Uh, next, some important bits of information. こちら、えっ、ー、と行動部コンダクトとなりまして、えっ、ー、と日本語で、えー、行動規範
という意味でございます。こちらはカンファレンスの参加している人たちが正しく行動、安心に行動活動。運営といいますか参加ができますように行動を定めております詳細はちょっと長いですので、えー、とこちらの URL に詳細記載しております日本語英語ございますので詳細こちらをご覧くださいまたその今回の参加の中で、えー、と行動規範にもしくはなんか触れているとか,なんか,おかあの不審な方がいるなんか大丈夫かなとか不審なこと不安なことがありましたらこちらのメールですね、coc.pycon.jp もしくは、えー、と本部がウエスト1 w 1にありますのでそちらに、えー、とお声がけください。Uh, it is important for us to, for PyCon APEC, to be a welcoming, safe, and comfortable space for anybody, everybody. And if,、uh, for that,、uh, you are required to read and follow the code of conduct that I'm sure you've all done.、Uh, in the case that there is any trouble, please do not share the It on the internet immediately. Instead, come contact us either in West One at the、uh, staff HQ or via email at coc at pycon.jp. すみません、補足で、えー、と英語では今言ったのですが、えー、ともし気になる場合がありましたら、ツイートとか公の場ではあまり発信は,あまり発信はせず、必ずこのスタッフの方にお声がけください。続きまして、えー、ともし分からないことがありましたら、えー、とスタッフ、えーとえー、たくさん今おります、今回おりますので、えーと、お声かけください。で、スタッフの判別なんですが、この T シャツ、はい、紺の、えー、T シャツを着ている方、またはスタッフ腕章をつけている方、または今回ですね、えー、ちょっとあの一般社団法人パイコン JP アソシエーションの、えー、とポロシャツもありまして、そちらの T シャツを着ている方がおります。えっ、ー、と例で言うとあの彼ですね。<笑>あのこの小豆色のポルシャツを着ている方もスタッフですのでご声掛けください。Yes, speaking of finding stuff for help,、um, you can identify stuff by either wearing this shirt、uh, that also says stuff on the back, or today these burg burgundy shirts as our lovely photographers here in Track One are wearing. Or、uh, the yellow stuff、uh, um, armband. はい、えー、続きまして、えー、食事と飲み物のご案内です、えー、食事は、えー、ランチ時間帯を除きましてトーク会場では禁止となっております飲み物は蓋の、えー、閉まるこのような感じの飲み物は会場でも飲むことができます、えー、また、えーとですね、20回えーですねえー、今回、会場20回もありまして、20回では、えー、ドリンクを提供してますし、えー、お菓子、駄菓子とかも今回和菓子、和菓子といいます、日本の駄菓子を用意しておりますので、ぜひ足を運んでください。Uh, yeah, uh, please refrain from eating、uh, in the talk rooms except during lunch when you, the talk rooms is where you should eat lunch.、Um, as for drinks, please only drink from bottles that can be closed by a cap in the talk rooms.、Uh, outside talk rooms, it's fine to have open containers.、Uh, the drink corner and snack corner this year is on the 20th floor, where there's also a lot of other stuff that we will announce shortly.、Um, but、uh, there's no drinks or anything like that here on the fourth floor. And the drink corner will close at about 3:30 today. はい、えー、続きまして、えー、と写真と動画についてご案内いたします。運営では、えー、写真とビデオを記録用に撮影しております、えー。特に撮影をされたくないという方用のためにこのようにこちらですね、えー、とネームタグの下に付けられるノーフォト、えーリボンを準備してますので、ぜひこちらをえっ、ー、とご利用ください。また撮影される方の向けなんですが、もしこういうリボンをつけている方とか、やはり明らかに取られたくないという方もいらっしゃいますので、そういう場合はあの配慮をお願いいた撮影の配慮をお願いいたします。Uh, you may have noticed that there's a bunch of people in stuff T-shirts with which are taking pictures all the time.、Uh, we will use these pictures for publications and future promotion of the event. And so those pictures are also going to end up on social media. If you do not wish to have your picture taken, please add a no photos、uh, ribbon to your name tag. Also, if you yourself are taking pictures, especially if you plan to upload them、uh, to the internet, please respect the no, ribbon,、uh, no photos ribbon and, if possible, ask for permission before uploading the photos. 
続きまして、えー、Wi-Fi インターネットの、えー、ご紹介です。こちら会場ではインターネットを、えー、提供していますので、こちらぜひご活用ください。またあのご自身で、えー、モバイルルーターとテザリング使うことは、えー、絶対 NG とまでは言いませんが、極力こちらの渾身を避けるためにこちらの、えーとえー、とネットワークをご利用ください。Uh, yeah, we have Wi Fi, of course, at the venue. The SSID should be self explanatory. The password is Python312, all lowercase. Also, please don't use your own Wi Fi access point here at the venue. If you want to know more about our Wi Fi setup, go talk to the Network Operations Center in East One. And yeah, so this morning we have again a few lost and found items. <laughs> So, still from yesterday, somebody lost their memory. <laughs> If you lost your memory, please come to HQ and get your memory. Yeah, it's not entirely sure if this is actually memory or some sort of key holder or something. From the code on it, it looks like 64 megabytes of RAM, which I don't know. Probably a key holder. Anyway, please get your memory. Yeah. And yes, we found another bag. This is not the same bag as yesterday. The bag yesterday, we found the owner, and during the time that we did the announcement, somebody else lost a different bag, which is this bag. And this bag was lost in the back of track two during closing. Please come pick it up at HQ. はい、えー、本日この後ですねクロージオープニングの後に、えー、キーノートスピーカーとしてドレーナメサさんを呼びしております今も会場に到着しておりますが、えー、この後キーノート基調講演していただきます And yeah, in a short while、uh, after the opening we will have the keynote of Lorena、uh, today 次まはい。<笑>え今日ですね、ゴートラックえ二十八トークあります。えぜひお楽しみください。And yeah, today,、uh, just like yesterday, we have five tracks, and as I mentioned in the closing yesterday, we have one more to talk today than yesterday. So those who showed up today, you get a bonus talk. Okay. はい。はい、続きまして今日のえ今回のえっと二千二十三のノベルティです。スポンサーさん六。6社さん以上、まあ、いっぱいたくさん回っていただきたいんですが、シードを集めるとこちらのタオルを交換できます。で、ちょっと昨日の参加の方もいるいるので、ちょっと残り若干数となっておりますので、集めた方は先着先着順となっておりますので、集めた方は早めに本部横のタオル交換場までお越しください。And yeah, we continue to have our sponsor booth、uh, sticker collection fun times. Where if you get at least six stickers from different sponsors by talking to them,、uh, you can go to the towel exchange center next to HQ and exchange your four stickers on the back of your name card、uh, for a fancy towel. There are only few towels remaining, so go get your towels soon. えー、続きまして昼,昼食のご案内ですランチのご案内ですこちら12時20分から13時40分の時間でランチ時間を設けておりますえっ、ー、と運営としてこちらのカンファレンスとしてお弁当を用意しております、えーえー、和食中華、えー、ハラル、えー、ビーガンなどありますのでご希望の方はそちら選んで、えー、食事お召し上がりくださいえっ、ー、と44回20回、えー、どちらにも、えー、とお弁当を準備しております。And yeah, we will have lunch again today, and I really hope that this that time is correct because I didn't check it.、Uh, anyway, the lunch will be provide,、uh, distributed outside the talk rooms, and then you can take it back into the talk rooms to eat、uh, on either the fourth or the 20th floor.、Uh, halal and vegan options are available, and I believe we have again a Chinese inspired option and I think a Japanese inspired option today. Hi, so the key is the coffee break. 
やはり頭を使うと思いますのでぜひコーヒーブレイクしながら、えー、とぜひ氷をつ、えー、取っていただきたいなと思いますこちら駄菓子の方20回ドリンクも20回に準備しておりますので、えー、こちらご活用ください And we will have again a coffee break in the afternoon、uh, around 3 p.m. on the 20th floor where there will be、uh, various、uh, drinks and foods and also fancy Japanese snacks. To the next one. 会場、えー、書籍販売、えー、休憩などですねリフレッシュメンツジョブボードウォーキング、えー、と充電スペース等を用意しておりますのでぜひご活用ください。And like yesterday but unlike last year we also used the 20th floor this time and on the 20th floor you will find track 5 poster sessions on conference open spaces bookstores only in Japanese refreshments job board working space and a charging space and also coffee which is quite important. はい、続きまして、えー、とオフィシャルパーティー、えー、準備しております、えー、今日ですね今日18時から、えー、準備しております、えー、ぜひあのこちら別途申し込みということなんですがオリジナルビールも準備しておりますので参加したいという方は別途申し込みが必要ですがこの後、えー、ツイートでも流します公式ツイートでもなな流しますが申し込みしていない方はぜひ参加したいという方はぜひご参加くださいはい続きまして、えー、と今日の。If that still doesn't work, come talk to the help desk. We are really sorry about the problems yesterday. Tsui Kade, Eto Hanashima, Eto Official Party, Kino Moshkomi, the Kinakata, Eto Hanashima, so Chida no system, Shio, a Kaisho Stolimas, Guan Sin Kudasai. Tsuki Mashte, Topan, Sanka Shani, Guan Naita Shimas, Sanka Moshkomi Sareta Katawa, Lanchi, Godesne, Lanchi Go Mata, Alatamete, Guan Naita Shimas, Lanchi Go, Chuo, Ukeske Bubun, Nite, Eto, Listo Bando, Kono Listo Bando, Desne, Kono Listo Bando, Oketori Kudasai, Mata, Osake Nomena Yo, Tukatawa, Kono, No Drink, No Alcohol, Stecka, Marimasone, Kochiamo, Oketori Kudasai. And for those of you who have already purchased a party ticket or are going to do it、uh, soon, you have to exchange your party ticket for a party wristband, which is not sponsored by a certain 100 yen shop.、Um, and you do this in the afternoon. We will announce it again later exactly when. We haven't fi figured a time. Sometime after lunch, and that's going to happen at reception. And please make sure to do that before about 5 30. Also, if you want to join the party but you do not wish to drink alcohol, please also pick up a no alcohol sticker and you get your wristband. And yeah. The party night lightning talk, LT, is available. こちらは20回参加されている方が対象となりますが、こちらまだ明確にこの申し込みは決めておりませんが、その場でえと参加者の中でえと。えー、と流れを組んで、えー、とトークしていただきたいと思いますので何かトークしたいなと思う方はちょっとパソコンとかで、えー、スライドとかも準備こちらで準備してますのでぜひ LT 発表したいなという方がいたらそこの場で募集があった場合には、えー、と参加ください。Uh, yeah, during the party, we should have time for a couple of lightning talks. Exactly how people sign up for those lightning talks is not decided yet. Basically, show up at the party with your talk ready, and we will figure it out. パーコミュニティスプリントを行いますこちら参加無料ですが申し込みが必要です場所は変わりまして渋谷にある変化株式会社さんの中で行います10時から17時29日日曜日に行います And tomorrow as we mentioned before we will have the sprints and the, importantly those sprints are not in this venue they're in Shibuya which is like an hour by train、uh, so don't show up here tomorrow and that's going to be 10am to 5pm 
and also requires you to register on pre-ticks. And like the party tickets, this should actually be a, uh, possible to do now. So you should be able to go to your order page and add that as an option. Again, if that doesn't work, the help text is in the middle. And also, the information about the sprint should now be on our website. Yay. <laughs> はい、え、オープニングえの案内は以上となります。え、ちょっと長くなってしまいましたが、え、今日もよろしくお願いします。なので、パイコンエイパック2023デイ2も楽しみましょう。皆さんよろしくお願いします。Yes, this concludes the opening and enjoy day 2. 続きましたキーノートになります。Hello. <laughs> ah, konnichiwa. How is everyone today for day two? Good. It's a little a little sleepy, so I think I think you all need a little more coffee at some point or awesome awesome tea. I've been loving the tea game here. I've been here for two weeks, and I want to steal all the capybaras. All the red pandas, I'm obsessed with all of the capsules and the gotchas here. Um, the maid cafe is very interesting. <laughs> but I just wanted to say thank you so much for having me. Arigato. OK, so the name of this talk, because I like really long names of talks, apparently, is Through the Looking Glass, kind of a reference to Alice in Wonderland. Um, 10 years of Python organizing, lessons and tribulations. So I'm sure any staff member here will tell you all of their own woes. But uh, there's a lot that you can learn about by being an organizer. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the community. And if there is time for Q&A, this is a little about 50 minutes. I'll take questions. Otherwise, I'll be in the hallway. Please feel free to come talk to me. I'm super happy to talk with you all. And if you would like to see any of the slides, you can check it there. Um, I, as you know, am Lorena Mesa. So that's me, one of my many hair colors. I'm currently doing purple. As my niece tells me, I look like a sea witch because it's either blue or it's purple or whatever color I do. I see a Northwestern sweatshirt. That's where I went for undergrad. Uh, so yeah, so what do I do? So I got involved with Python and I'll talk a little bit about my origin story since we have a great gaming culture here. But what I currently do, I organize Pi Lady Chicago. I'm a former director and chairperson of the Python Software Foundation. Who here knows what the Python Software Foundation is? Oh my gosh, that number is always so bad. <laughs> but don't worry, you'll get some info from me. I'm also a Python Software Foundation Fellow, which means some cool people nominated me. And you can nominate awesome people in your community as well. It's just in a way to kind of say, hey, our community is awesome. Let's empower each other. Um, I did do Python at my former job at GitHub. I actually just got hired at Netflix, did my part of my onboarding, then came here, and then I'm doing my team onboarding when I turn around and go to Mexico in 36 hours. So, <laughs> so it's been, it's a whirlwind. I, I'm doing a lot. Um, and then I'm a huge, huge advocate around responsible computer science. You can find me uh, most places on the web as Lorena Nicole. Yes, that is four O's. Do we have any soccer fans here? Or as I like to call it, football. <laughs> Some people, okay, I was watching Mexican, uh, I was watching Mexican football and one of the things they do when there's a score, they go, go Lazo. So I incorporated that into my handle when I was on the Twitter, well, well formerly known as Twitter, I don't even want to talk about that platform. I'm on Blue Sky, I'm on Mastodon, I'm on Instagram. You can find, if you throw a rock, you can probably find me somewhere. <laughs> So yeah, that's a little about me. So ways I started getting involved with Python, 
I have always been a huge live long and prosper. I'm a huge Trekkie. I actually am learning Klingon, so Kepla. <laughs> um, as you can see, that is Jean-Luc Picard in the bottom right. Uh, I am a huge marathoner. I do Taekwondo. I know that it's not a Japanese martial art. I'm very sorry, <laughs> but that's the one my dad put me in. But I actually have always been involved in some way, shape, or form with organizing. I helped Organized Sisters, which is the Anita Borg Initiative for Women in Coding. I have helped organize Tecaria, which is for people from Latin America or of Latin American heritage. I have been involved with Obama for America. I am from Chicago. I have helped start and organize Chicago Tech Diversity Initiative. Data for Democracy, which I will talk a little bit about. A conference called Write, Speak, Code, which is a three-day conference focused at marginalized genders in coding. And each day is dedicated to one thing. So writing, how do we write technical content? Speaking, what does, what does public speaking look like in the tech space? And then code, meaning open source code. Who knows Carol Willing? Yeah, her daughter works here in uh, Tokyo, so uh, I think she's actually going to be here in a few weeks, so you should make sure to find her. She's a founder of one uh, core Python developer and a founder of the Project Jupyter uh, program. If you've all ever used Jupyter Notebooks, Carol is awesome, so make sure to find her, but she helps a lot with uh, this conference on the code day. And yeah, obviously Python Software Foundation. So. Haruki Murakami, one of my favorite authors. Uh, one of the things I've learned about being an organizer, I feel like is really something that like Haruki Murakami like inspired me to think a lot about. Uh, he wrote this memoir that says, what I talk about when I talk about running. And it's his perspective on how it is that you can think about channeling trials and tribulations, that is challenges in your life into productive outlets. It's only about like 100 pages. It's an awesome read. It made me feel good about not having the best marathon time that year. Uh, I've been running marathons since 2007. I've done 20 marathons so far. I am doing my first ultra later this year, so wish me luck. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if I'm still walking after that. But being a marathoner and kind of the way that Haruki Murakami wrote about his idea of taking adversity on and making it his own helped me think a lot about what it means to be an organizer. So when I talk about being an organizer, I talk a lot about ethics. I talk a lot about diversity. I talk a lot about inclusion. And people ask me why I do that. So I'm from Chicago. That is the Windy City. I hate to tell you, I've seen on some pizza menus here, Chicago pizza, and it does not, that is not how we eat pizza. We don't eat deep dish, like that, like that giant thing that's like a quarter of cheese. I don't know where that came from, but <laughs> I really don't know where that came from. When you think of Chicago, you might see this skyline. Chicago hosted the World's Fair in 1898. We actually invented the Ferris wheel, so when I was in Osaka on the world's largest Ferris wheel. Someone asked me where I'm from. I'm like, oh, Chicago. And they went, you made the Ferris wheel. I was really impressed. They knew that fact. <laughs> but um, I'm from Chicago. And if you know anything about Chicago, it is the third largest city in the United States. And it's also the home of this guy. So we know who this is, right? He's the good president. He's not the other one. He's not Cheeto or, you know, whatever color that one <laughs> So I got involved with, uh, so as I mentioned, I went to Northwestern. That's me with my natural color <laughs> in terms of hair. And I graduated in, well, I graduated in 2008. So as we remember, for those of us who are a little older in this community, because I'm 36 now, I, I aged myself the other day. I said I was 42. I don't, I don't remember my age anymore, so I'm just going to prematurely do that. Um, but yeah, I graduated during a global recession. That's when the banks went belly up. That's when there was a lot of struggle with the financial sector. And around the world, we all felt it in some way, shape, or form. Because mortgages in the United States were being sold to people who could not afford them. And a lot of people that were being sold these mortgages happened to be 
communities that are underrepresented. For example, Latino communities. I'm Latina, my mom's from Cuba, my papa's from Mexico, and I'm first generation. I'm actually the first person to graduate college in my entire family. So I actually had family members who were impacted by this crisis, and I got involved with this campaign. Because to me, it was super important to work for someone who believed in doing something positive. And while his politics aren't you know, 110% above board, there's things I didn't agree with, I did believe in someone who had a vision, and I really, really appreciated how he was trying to meet people where they were at. So, Huffington Post says, were it not for the internet, Barack Obama would not be president. Were it not for the internet, Barack Obama would not have been the nominee. And what I'm trying to point out here is that the internet was really pivotal in this political campaign. It changed the way that politics work as we know it in the United States. And I would argue that had an effect around the world. So, some examples of that. Using social media, that is, you know, the platform we, we know as Twitter, <laughs> uh, YouTube, et cetera. Um, GOTVs, get out the vote. That's when you would meet people and talk about registering them to, to come and vote. Uh, and th these initiatives were informed by something called data science. And then we would have these personalized groups, again, informed by things like data science where it'd be fill in the blank for Obama, Latinos for Obama, moms for Obama. I once saw moms who are hot for Obama, which was very interesting, <laughs> but uh, it, there was a lot of customized work. And so this is where my, um, this is where my uh, abuela is from. She's from right on the border in a town called Piedras Negras. And the reason I point this out is this part of the country has a lot of interesting geopolitics. Uh, unfortunately, in the United States, there's a lot of, for lack of a better word, there's a lot of fear of having more people come from Latin America to come work because there's this fear that the country is going to be less, as a certain Cheeto president would say, not make America great again. <laughs> so. As you can see, we have Latinos for Obama, we have Tejanos for Obama, you could have Cubanos for Obama. There's a lot of these customized kind of outreach initiatives that were happening. So I mentioned data science, and the reason I mentioned data science is because data science in, in like 2007, 2008, that word didn't exist yet. And I was working in this campaign as the only intern on the Latinos for Obama team, and I was told, here's data. I actually have a background in math. They're like, use your math. Figure out how we find people. And I'm like, okay, how do I do this? <laughs> but I love this quote, the um, data scientist, a person who's better at stats than any software and better at software engineering than any statistician. Uh, I, I guess that's kind of true, uh, you know, because somehow a data scientist is supposed to be this unicorn that does all the things. Um, if you do that, that's awesome. I'm not a unicorn. Um, maybe I'm a narwhal, but not a unicorn. <laughs> and so the way I started getting involved with Python is I actually turned to this group. So has anyone ever heard of Chippy? I'm guessing not. <laughs> <laughs> I saw one hand. Chicago Python user group. There's, again, a lot of cute animals that are representing various communities in Python. And ours in Chicago is Chippy. And it's this little fat chipmunk that types and has glasses. So I actually turned to our local Python user group because I was like, I don't know how to do this. I had experience programming in like HTML, CSS. I had some experience with R and SAS, but I did not know how to actually use a programming language because I do not have a computer science uh, degree. I actually have a degree in mathematics, political science with a minor in astrophysics. I don't know, I've lived many lives. <laughs> so from there, when I say I talk about ethics, Back to Chicago. So Chicago sits along Lake Michigan. So to the uh, over here would be Lake Michigan. 
And Chicago is very segregated. Unfortunately, Chicago is a city that was built uh, with something in mind called redlining. It was a practice when the army came home from World War II, they were given loans for their homes. Those loans were extended to white Americans, not to other people. So what happened, then the highways started getting built. Where the highways were built happened to be in communities that were black, that were Hispanic, that were Asian heritage, et cetera. So Chicago is very segregated. As you can see, the northwest side, white. South side, we have black. We have a pocket of, of Hispanic. I actually grew up in this area over here and uh, other communities as well. And as you can see as well, the actual average household income is divided along these lines as well. It's much more affluent on the north side than it is on the south side. And Obama and Michelle, uh, Barack and Michelle Obama are actually from University of Chicago area in Hyde Park, which is this little pocket right here, where I'm also an associate professor. It's a great university, sadly a place that helped uh, in the development of the atomic bomb. I went to Hiroshima, I was crying, it was terrible, I am so sorry. <laughs> for what my country has done, but uh, that little pocket is a bit of an outlier. So another thing about Chicago, uh, in 2017, our mayor, uh, Rahm Emanuel, who did work for Obama as his chief of staff, actually started saying, you know what, for policing, let's just try to automate it. Let's do predictive policing. And the idea of predictive policing, it was saying we're gonna use software to try to predict where crime will happen. A little like Minority Report, if you've seen that movie, which is terrifying. And, they, and the mayor specifically said, let's make sure we employ this specifically on the south side. So remember, the south side, lower income, that's where it's people of color who live there, and it's an area that's just not being invested in as much. So another thing that happened in Chicago at this time is, anyone read The Guardian? It's a news publication? Yeah, so they did this expose uh, around people being disappeared in the Chicago Police Department Essentially, you have rights in the United States that say within 24 hours, you have to be booked for something for a crime. If not, then they should release you or at least allow you to have a lawyer. But these people were being disappeared for multiple days on end and they happened to be non-white people in Chicago. And part of the work of how we figured this out, in Chicago, again, using Python, we were, investigating public data that we requested to figure out where people were going. We had to request the data from the Chicago Police Department to figure out where were people going. We didn't, we, we received, I think it was like a terabyte of data. It was terrible, it was a really manual process. But again, Chicago Python user group, we, we got a group together and we started crunching the numbers and then we were able to give data to the Guardian to help make this public announcement. And then we have the ACLU. So the ACLU talks about how, and we've heard this time after time after time, facial recognition, uh, facial recognition technology is just not on par. So ACLU is American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, and what they do is they watch out in the United States for problematic human rights issues. And what they were finding was in tools that were being created, things were being falsely labeled. So uh, again, um, this work, some of us here at Chicago, uh, some of us at the Chicago Python user group were actually studying this data to figure out how, how bad it was labeling people and we found that it was incorrectly or over, uh, overestimating people of color as being uh, potentially a, a criminal. So why am I talking about all this? The reason I'm talking about all this is I used to work at a company named Sprout Social. It, it was a company that, do, that does social media management for like all of the platforms. And I was working on the back end, doing Python work. It was my first job in tech. 
and I didn't really think much about it. I knew I was donating my time, doing things that were impactful, helping as I could with my value set in line, but then this dropped, the ACLU. They said, oh hey, um, the Chicago Police Department is using social media data to try to find activists and arrest them. And companies are intentionally selling software to the police to say, hey, this is how you can use our software to find the activists. You can use things like hashtags Black Lives Matter or hashtag I can't breathe, things like that. And what was terrible about it is I learned that my company was one of the companies named by the ACLU that was selling software to law enforcement to do this kind of thing. I did not know what to do. <laughs> my first job in tech, I had left my PhD program, I made a big change, and I just felt sick to my stomach. Because then at the, around the same time, the murder of Laquan McDonald. He was shot 13 times. A young black man with no gun on him, shot 13 times, and this is what the police department's doing, and I'm helping write software that's allowing them to do this kind of bad stuff. And I love this photo with Mark Zuckerberg talking to Congress. He actually had to sit on a pillow, so he looked taller. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, I just think that's hilarious. <laughs> um, oh, look, at, he looks so pale there. Uh, I wonder if he's wearing flip-flops. He likes to wear flip-flops. But, uh, you know, we all started realizing social media. This was something that was really problematic. And I had used social media on the Obama campaigns to help get Obama into, into office. I thought this was a great tool. But then when we write software, we don't know how it's going to be used. And that was one of the first things I learned as an organizer was we have to think about the long-term perspective. Just because we can, should we do it? Then we have things like this, the Me Too movement, where we had people coming out, talking about their stories around uh, sexual harassment. We have, uh, <laughs> we have a very problematic man who became president in the United States using social media to further galvanize his mission of hatred. We had on the bottom right, we have moderation continuing to be an issue, and the people who are doing the moderation were people like being paid cents on the dollar in the Philippines. We are outsourcing this work to people that already are trying to find a way forward in their life, but yet the big wigs in Silicon Valley can't figure out a good solution. And it's traumatic what these people can see. They don't get to say, oh, I wanna see only this kind of content. They have to see all of the content. And as we know, with all these platforms, we put, I look on the internet for capybara videos eating like oranges or red pandas eating apples, but they don't like lemons. <laughs> but other people are using it for malicious means. So, you know, it's hard for us as technologists to sit there and say, what have we created and how are we going to move forward? And then even more problematic is, of course, you know, the president I don't want to name, his account eventually got blocked after like an insurrection attempt. But when there was people talking about sexual assault, their accounts get blocked. And that's not even to say how that platform has changed and who now owns it. So we have all of this as well as bots. As we all know, bots are everywhere. <laughs> I think I get like on average like 10 messages from bots on Instagram telling me, oh, we like your Maine Coons. We wanna like dress them up, which is cool in theory, but I'm not giving you my info no, I'm smarter than that. Don't try to fish me. So ethical tech, and I think that's something that goes hand in hand with us as Pythonistas, us as creators of tools in the world, is we have to think about our accountability. So when I think about data ethics, I like this three-prong approach. 
The ethics of data, that's how is our data generated, created, stored? Ethics of algorithms, that is how are our tools like chat, G, ugh, I can never say that. How our AI is, is talking to us. <laughs> Um, and how, how is it that we are creating learning for those tools? And then the ethics of practice. That is what we're doing right here. How do we practice better? How do we start the conversation? How do we inspire others to, to think about this as well? So, you know, when we think about like machine learning, and machine learning does all this kind of stuff, right? It, can do cute things like process sound of whales and birds. Also, I love all the jingles on the train here. The bird sounds make me very happy. Uh, we can predict uh, real-time alerts from social media, like, hey, there was an environmental catastrophe, check on your people. Um, predict wait times and airport security lines, which I will have to do this afternoon. <laughs> um, we can find things around uh, uh, we, can, we can do things like provide access to buildings, um, and we can do things like finding, uh, I've been using Google Translate a lot to read signs, because I'll see like a cute animal on it, and I'm like, but everything here has cute animals. <laughs> so using like Google Translate, the, the, the image, um, we can use machine learning for that. So machine learning does have some practical impacts, but it also can be, as we see, um, used incorrectly. So uh, I always like to say that when we talk about uh, machine learning, I imagine many of you probably have heard this definition before, but basically uh, I think the Tom Mitchell definition is pretty great. A uh, program is set to learn from some experience with respect to some task and some performance measure if its performance on T as measured by P improves with experience on E. So ETP, that's what I teach my students all the time. So I, there's been a lot of people who've been thinking about all of this. Uh, the book on the right, Chaos Monkeys, has anyone heard of that by chance? Cool, we have some folks who've heard of it. Um, it's actually the guy who like created ads for Facebook. He is, uh, I feel kind of bad I bought the book because I don't want to give that person money, but I like buying books, so I don't know. But it, he talks about like the whole, it's like, uh, it's like the stock market in the 80s, like how Facebook is just like the Wild West and how they created ads. Very interesting perspective. And then algorithms of, of, of oppression. Um, what I really appreciate is this is a woman of color who wrote this, um, but talking about how like index, how, how things get indexed on search engines, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'm sure many of us have heard of Weapons of Math Destruction, who was instrumental in the Occupy Wall Street movement, a former quant uh, on stock, on, the, on Wall Street who realized, kind of like myself, <laughs> the things we do have impacts. <laughs> so when we think back to that three-prong approach, you know, how do we store data, what's our practices, what our algorithms do, um, we can write our algorithms better if we have a different metric, right? If we have a different performance measurement that we can optimize on. So instead of optimizing for profit, we can optimize for fairness. And that's a huge part of what Kathy O'Neill is actually doing now, as well as the Algorithm League of Justice, ALG. They are fantastic. They're doing some really cool work with face recognition technology. So as we know, this is kind of the landscape of machine learning and where we're seeing more things, I think, that are not being paid attention to, I think it's this area. I don't think we're doing enough in our learning principles. I don't think we're doing enough in the education area. I don't think we have enough conversations about this. There's spaces where we have these conversations, but I don't see it in the mainstream. And I think with everything that's happening with AI right now, again, I was just at GitHub, Microsoft owns us, and uh, not no ill qualms towards them. Everything in tech right now is like, oh, AI is the future. Let's just fire a bunch of people, make everything about AI, make people's positions redundant. But what happens when people don't have employment? What is the future of work? So we have to think about these things. And I think an area where we need to invest more is in the practical examples. So I mentioned data for democracy, and data for democracy is kind of like a list of tenants, is kind of a list of tenants that, and 
is like the Hippocratic Oath. So doctors take an oath to say, I will help people get better and I will always make sure to take care of them regardless of their political views, et cetera, et cetera. Well, why don't we come up with something like that for us as practitioners? And in some spaces, for example, in the Scandinavian countries, they are actually thinking about this. They are actually thinking about ways to try to have some kind of enforcement and try to hold people accountable, so to speak, put your feet to the fire. But uh, this has yet been kind of just more like open source grassroots movements. And I understand it's very lofty. It's, it's easy to say we care about these things. It's harder to, to enforce them. Uh, for example, my friend Heidi, she is someone who writes software for mission critical systems. So for example, like when Chernobyl melted down, we know that there was actually um, issues with the hardware that was used, and we know that there was actual research that was not shared with the, with the practitioners that were maintaining that. As we know, nuclear reactors, the melting down, <laughs> uh, not good, but she writes testing software to help kind of think through how do we prevent meltdowns. And another thing that she does is like aut autonomous driving vehicles. So we've heard of the runaway car situation or the runaway train example where you have a train and there is one person on the track. Do you save the one person on the track or do you save the people on the train? And that moral conundrum is a hard one. And obviously, you know, do you sacrifice the one for the many, or do you sac or do we value all life equally? So these things are hard in practice. So while this is a good lofty kind of goal, I understand it's going to be a work in progress. And how we move forward on this is going to be something I think in 20 years. What's the next gen? We have Gen Z. I think Alpha is next. Alpha is going to be telling us, hey. Besides the environment being messed up, like what else have you all done with technology? And that's the thing that I'm thinking about. I have, I have a niece, I have two nephews. My niece, Ziggy, is six. My nephews are three and two. And I think about what the future is going to be for them. I think about how they use social media or they don't use social media. I think about the tools that we create with facial recognition with facial recognition and how there's bias in there. I think about the spaces that we create that are incredibly being consumed by technology. And spaces like the Python community, I think are instrumental in helping us challenge those ideas and confronting the challenges that we will have today and we will continue to have tomorrow. So an example of like some of the ways I think data has been being used well, for example, uh, not that this is a huge problem, I think, here in Japan, because I, I think here the food is much healthier. <laughs> but in the United States, I'll just argue that our portions are like three times as large, like deep fried and not healthy and just not the best. <laughs> and we don't walk as much. We don't have pub we don't believe in public infrastructure and our cars are like giant, just not a good look, not a good look. <laughs> But um, this project came out of MIT, and I think it's awesome. And they actually are starting to use it on some uh, on on a lot of data sets. Is they're saying, okay, like on a food product that tells you this is how many uh, calories, this is what's in it, et cetera, et cetera. On our data sets, we can start doing the same things. We can we can index with keywords. We can specify the domain. We can have URL. We can have people who are actually tagged that are the ones who generated that data set. So remember, ethical data, how we generate data. That's, that's a way that we can kind of confront some of this. Um, I'm an editor for the Journal of Open Source Software, and this actually was a project that came out of there. And if you ever want to publish a paper, Journal of Open Source Software is a pretty cool place to check out. Uh, it's all automated on GitHub. It's really easy to go through the process. But this kind of thing is easy and understandable. And what I like about it too is it's actually been localized now into multiple languages. So it's the official UN languages and even some indigenous languages that I thought was pretty cool. Uh, back to practical examples. Again, that's one of the th parts of the three-prong approach with ethical data. 
How do we educate people? I don't know what the initiatives look like here in Japan, but something that I've appreciated in the United States has been this project with Mozilla, specifically the Responsible Computer Science Challenge. So a group of practitioners, myself included, were invited to be on the panel to evaluate proposals from universities across the United States to see how they're incorporating ethics into their curriculum and what does that look like? Not just like a, a box to be checked, but actually incorporating it. So Allegheny College in New York was one that received this. Berkeley, Harvard obviously, and I think we initially invited 20 schools to participate. So now we've been through the first cohort of schools. It's a two-phase part. The first was the development of the curriculum, then actually implementing the curriculum with a small subset of students and then expanding it across the entire university as a requirement. So this, this initiative has been really great and now the MacArthur Foundation is backing this as well. Some of the areas that they are looking at, that we looked at include the approach, feasibility, how, how novel is the concept, What's the impact look like? This one I really liked, movement building. I think that's really important. Um, and scalability, obviously really important. Because I think there's a lot to be said about, again, checking the box, saying, oh, I took that one mandatory class at eight in the morning on Monday for a quarter or whatever. It, it, it sucked. <laughs> but actually, a lot of um, the way that we're thinking about ethics in uh, computer science is it's not a standalone class. It's actually incorporated across classes for undergrad students, and now it's being expanded. The Kennedy School is doing it at Harvard for their folks who are doing like a digital approach to kind of government le uh, leadership. In the United States, we have a program that's called 18F, uh, which was for us novel. It's part of the General Service Administration where we have local governments that are getting professional support from people who are technologists that come from the fields, uh, working you know working at top working at top companies, and they they take like a year, uh, two years of service or four years of service to come and work. So uh, they are uh, they also are helping with this component right here, the movement building and scalability. And then other ways I think that we can see the fairness being used. So I mentioned Berkeley. Um, so Berkeley actually has put out some really good publications around how you can retool loans to not optimize for profit, but instead to optimize for fairness. And what they kind of started to say was, let's look at folks that have been denied loans and see ways that we can better balance that and distribute loans to be more equitable. Because again, in 2008, 2009, that's when the mortgage crisis happened. Everyone was able to get a loan, but with really high interest rates in the United States. And we're seeing it again now with a potential global recession where people have been given easy access to credit, but with really high interest rates. And that's how we've been seeing a lot of things kind of starting to kind of crumble a little bit. So seeing this kind of thing, not only is it good for individuals, but it's good for the world, <laughs> so I hope we can continue to move forward with things like that. So again, why I talk about ethics, why I talk about ethics at Python conferences, because Python's huge. Uh, <laughs> so Python, um, this is 28 result, uh, 2018 results, and this is from Stack Overflow. I know Stack Overflow can be kind of, I'm gonna just shake my hand, I know. People have strong opinions on there, it's sometimes like Reddit. <laughs> but uh, Python has exponentially grown. And why has it grown? We know this, because it can be used in the academics, it can be used in science, it can be used in research. It's great for kids to learn to code on. My niece is learning Python and she's six years old. I mean, she doesn't have a choice, like I kind of like I'm forcing her, but. <laughs> But she's learning it. And that's kind of what this survey talks about, is Python has a lot of appeal. It's a language that is 
intentionally easy to learn, intentionally meant to have all batteries included. It has a great standard library. Our core developers are consistently listening to us. Uh, if you come to PyCon US and you happen to see Marietta, Marietta gives great talks. I think it was, I want to say her 2019 talk? maybe 2018, she gave a great talk about how to become a core developer, and the captions, because she got emotional talking about how she wants to see more women to be core developers, she started kind of tearing up, and the captioner wrote, we love you, Marietta. It was adorable. It was very, very cute. And I mentioned I would talk about the Python Software Foundation. Uh, we're able to spread grants around the world. By the way, this number to me is very sad. 8%, you all have to apply more for grants. So what is the grant program? If you wanna run something like PyCon APAC, or you want to have a local meetup, or you want to do a workshop at a university, or you wanna do a development sprint, you can actually ask for some money from the Python Software Foundation the proceeds from PyCon US, uh, as well as other properties that we, that we have, fund this. So, you know, this number needs to decrease, in my opinion, I think we're doing good there. But Australia, you need, a, you need to up your game too. So Australia and Asia, and Asia, I'm looking at you. I'm on the grants review committee, so if you have questions, come talk to me. You can email me and be like, Lorena, I have questions. And, I'll be a weirdo and respond at like three in the morning my time. <laughs> so how much money are we giving? So this is the most recent number that we've shared publicly, 324,000 in 2018 to 51 countries. So the, I think there's, I don't know how many countries there are in the world. I've been to 50 countries, which is cool. So that's the way I like to think of it. <laughs> a lot with Python. So uh, that's 22.6% more than in 2017. So we have more and more money. Actually, the PSF now has over $2 million in assets. And we've been trying to grow that number every year and rely less on PyCon US, so we have a healthy reserve. We're actually projected to have more than four million in under two years. And that, as a nonprofit software foundation, is awesome. We actually didn't lose money during this last recession or during the pandemic. Uh, I don't know how we did that. I think probably our lawyer <laughs> helped us a lot with that. Um, but yeah, so the mission of the Python Software Foundation is to promote, protect, and advance the Python programming language and to support and facilitate the growth of a diverse and international community of Python programmers. So if, you've, if any of you know uh, Youngun Kim or Georgie Key or uh, Iqbal Abdullah, they are fantastic people to ask questions about. Um, they've been involved with our diversity and inclusion work group. I saw a diversity part of the uh, expo with the Python Software Foundation area, uh, please talk to people and ask how you can be involved or if you have questions. Because for me, yeah, it's cool that like the Python Software Foundation exists, but we really do need to meet our international community of Python programmers. The PSF also holds the patent for Python. So if you have questions around like uh, trademark, things like that, you can actually reach out to the Python Software Foundation. We have a lawyer on staff who can help with some of those questions. And we also help with volunteer efforts. So if you're organizing an event and let's say you wanna have a training for code of conduct, we can help that and we can pay for that if you want. So we offer a lot, a lot of help with offering our community what they need. Um, something else that with the grants, as you can see, is we also do this develop uh, this ambassador program. So we had an ambassador in West Africa, East Africa, and Latin America. So someone who actually was given some money to help evangelize Python in their area. So if that's something you're thinking about, like, oh, I saw PyLadies has an Okinawa chapter now, which is awesome. Um, Let's say there was someone from PyLadies who wanted to grow more chapters and go to universities to speak. That would be a great example of a grant. And as you can see, we support conferences. 
Um, so in terms of directors that I served with, this was the group that I served with. And as you can see, there was one, two, three, four continents represented. So now we have, I think, only three continents represented. Uh, we just had uh, an election in June. So what I I'm hoping is that we get back to four or five or six. Someone wants to move to Antarctica and be our first Antarctican, that's a word I think, uh, director, that'd be awesome. Um, so Marlene, Zimbabwe, me, that's our lawyer. Uh, Germany, uh, Chicago, United States, Kushal, India, Tanya of, um, from Mexico but lives in the UK, and Deborah is from uh, Brazil. So another reason I talk about ethics is it's the people who came before us that inspire us. Sorry if I'm a little emotional. This was my mentor in Chicago. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away. And Tanya was someone who gave everything to her community. I mean, literally everything. Uh, she took care of her mother who uh, had advanced Alzheimer's and would bring her to all of the meetups. I loved her mom, I would braid her hair all the time. But she was someone who is a published author, someone with two PhDs, spoke seven languages, programmed in a whole bunch, but it's people like that, it's people like Tanya, who inspire me for what I do. So with, with PyLadies, uh, an example of how I think we can have an exponential impact, again, three-prong approach, our practices, what does it look like? PyLadies Chicago, when I actually joined the Chicago Python user group, Chippy, there was like no women minus Tanya. Uh, and sadly, it was a group that had some not so cool practices of like hanging out at the bar and being there until like two in the morning. And there was some kind of gross other behavior with the way men treated women and just wasn't, I didn't feel the most included there. So I started Pilate of Chicago in 2015. I can't believe it's been eight years. <laughs> and we've had over, well, yeah, over 75 events. We're doing a deep learning study group for fast.ai next. And we have a community of over 1,200 members. So again, something, something that one person starts, or like four people in my case, can have an exponential impact. So I don't know how many people you have on staff here, but they're the kind of folks that do amazing things. And I know each of you here are doing that as well. So PyLadies has over 100 chapters worldwide, and most of them are in the United States and the Commonwealth, meaning like UK, Canada, and Europe. And we started in uh, 20, oh my gosh, what year was that? I should know this. 20, <laughs> 2011, I believe, was the year we started. Um, and one of the things I think that's really interesting has been this, the comparison of the R community to the Python community. In R, as you can see, 9% of package authors were women. Again, this is self-reported data. And unfortunately, what we're seeing is number in Python, 2%. So we need to do better there. And that's just one way of looking at it. We can look at it from nations, we can look at it from age, we can look at it from uh, orientation, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> yeah, I know, my computer battery is like always dead. I, I, was, I was watching too many Red Panda videos, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, so some of the things that, that were called out that work well in the R community, notice this one, prominent men supporting. I think we do that well in this community, so keep it up. <laughs> but um, funding, and I think, again, I made the case that we don't do enough there's not enough funding that's being utilized when we have that money available. Then infrastructure, board versus no board. We do have a board, we have a board of directors. You all should run for the board, come talk to me. It's a volunteer thing, five hours a month. You can go say cool words to people. <laughs> um, enthusiasm and priority. We're not short of enthusiasm or priority, especially like I saw uh, one of the staff folk wearing like a, a pumpkin and I, that made me very happy. But what I do think 
is the funding is a big one. And I think some of the infrastructure needs to really change. So that, that would be the big areas that I would call out. So at 2019, uh, PyCon US, so that's Lynn Root. She's one of the folks who helped found PyLadies. We got together and we started talking about how can we do better with PyLadies? Again, three-prong approach. How can we impact better our, our, practice, our practicing, um, the way we practice Python? And what we decided is that we really need to get our PyLadies group together. It's very decentralized, which is great because anyone can start a PyLadies chapter, but there's not a lot of communication, let's say, between PyLadies in Japan and PyLadies in the United States. We don't know what everyone needs, and we do actually have money from the Python Software Foundation that we can tap into, but we're not distributing it. We raise a lot of money at the PyLadies auction at PyCon US, where we sell ridiculous things like guitars with Python on it, or like portraits with, with uh, Guido's face on it. Just uh, someone bought a pen for like 1,500 US dollars. <laughs> yeah, I, Chuk is laughing about that one because it's our friend Dustin who did that. Um, but yeah, there was, there's just like a lot of things we're not tapping into. So our takeaways were we need a global body, we need to manage PyLadies like an actual open source project, and we need to make sure we have working groups, because that's the way the Python Software Foundation works, and it's very impactful. So, coming up, who has heard of the PyLadies Global Conference? Okay, of course I know Jonas has heard of it, and of course I know Chuk has heard of it, because Chuk is helping with it. Um, but if you haven't, go look at the PyLadies poster, check it out, it's gonna be December 1st to the 3rd, online and we're gonna have multiple languages so we will offer translation. And the call for proposal is technically still open. And if you want to give us money, we would be happy to take your money. So give us your money. <laughs> um, you can also check out PyLadies on GitHub. So it's, it's uh, under the handle PyLadies and you could just look at global organizing. And we do have a Slack community. And yes, men are welcome in the Slack community. Just understand the space is for PyLadies. So abide by our code of conduct. By the way, the, all these stickers are from my desk. <laughs> and the, the F string, that's from Marietta. I love this. <laughs> So when I talk about organizing and I talk about the challenges and, and ethics and why I do all the things I do, it's because we rock. We are awesome. Let's give ourselves a hand of a, like, pause. So this is when my hair was red, as you can tell. <laughs> I'm clearly like the really white one in the middle. <laughs> but um, this is PyLadies at the uh, PyLadies I forgot what they call assembly at, at uh, PyCon Brazil. And PyCon Brazil has a really good actual infrastructure for PyLadies. And we've actually been trying to emulate their example. This is from PyCon uh, Africa. And I love this photo. I think it's so cool. They had like a really cool like dance party and I was like, I am super white. I don't know how to dance like this. <laughs> but again, I talk about us. We are awesome people. So again, awesome people, Guido saying, I love pie ladies with a portrait of Guido with like a rabbit and like many Easter eggs. But honestly, our community just makes me so happy. And I, it's been such an honor to be here today and to talk with you all. So if you do have, uh, I think we're getting close to time. As I mentioned, if you do have any questions, you can come talk to me. I'll hang out in the hallway for a bit. Um, these are some resources I've used, if you're ever curious about some of this. Um, machine Learning for All Conf. Their last one was in, was in April 2019, but they're starting to organize again now that we're like past the peak pandemic. Um, papers we love, they read white papers, um, so research papers, and then they like explain like kind of a, an emerging area of research. They have a really, really cool GitHub account if you're curious and you want to just go explore. Um, uh, NumFocus is another great foundation that I love, open source initiative, and more and more. Uh, let's see. Cool. So you can reach me at 
Lorena at python.org, Lorena at pyladies.com, Lorena at whatever, or again, Lorena Nicole, any corner of the internet. So, arigato. Yeah, not sure where we are for time, but if, yeah, if anyone does want to talk to me, I, I, I'm happy to hang out or I don't know when the next talk is. <laughs> Thank you for your great keynote. Thank you. And uh, in, in this room, in this PyCon APAC one room, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. Ah, fantastic. Staff brings uh, handy mic. Thank you for such a uh, passionate uh, presentation. Uh, how did you beca become such a pas passionate person? Is that uh, <laughs> your characteristic or uh, physical training or something? <laughs> I think maybe my parents had a hand in it. Um, I, I joke that the volume in my family starts at louder then uh -huh. it's loudest, and then it's just called the Mesa style of being loud. But um, no, I, I really do think that I get a lot of energy from the community. And to me, it's super important to remember where we come from and to learn. So finding people that inspire you, like I found Carol Willing on, on social media. I found uh, Naomi Cedar on the internet. Oh. I emailed Guido, like, the fir like my first PyCon, and he responded, and he actually helped mentor me. So I think finding people that inspire you and reaching out to them is a really good way of doing it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Other uh, question? Oh, thank you for your great talk. And I, this is uh, for the record, actually. Uh, uh, your, your talk is great for the ethics, right? But I think some of your talk contains the most unethical expressions here because many attendees are from the APEC region mm -hmm. and we have a long history. Yeah. So some of your comments uh, are heartbreaking some of our people. Uh, so yeah. please think about that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And that's why I did try to say from my hometown, from my area. But I think that's really, really important. Thank you so much for your comment. Thank you. Okay, uh, hello, so uh, I'm Dima from Indonesia. I just want to thanks to PSF uh, because PyCon Indonesia is also having grants from PSF uh, in three years in a row. Thank you so much for PSF. Uh, but I have some uh, questions, maybe it's gonna be a lot of discussion, but I want to know how uh, in Indonesia, uh, Python community is not, uh, did not have a lot of branding. Uh, uh -huh, actually, uh -huh. we have four chapters in regionals, but mm -hmm. uh, all of them still struggling into having their events because creating an event needs money. And right. uh, for PyCon uh, itself, we also we got the grants for from PSF. Uh -huh. The money for PyCon is ends there. Uh, it didn't support us for the next even for yearly. So I want to ask if. The PSF still uh, gonna give us uh, supports uh, through the grants for our annual, uh, not uh, like monthly meetup for each regionals or right, something right, right. because uh, if we some of our regionals really rely on PyCons uh, yep. to have their uh, to show that PyCon community exists in Indonesia. Right, Thanks. right. That uh, that's a very good point. So one of the things I would say is, that I forgot to mention. And we need to explore other platforms. Uh, unfortunately, all the staff for the Python Software Foundation aren't necessarily themselves developers. Uh, e, for example, who handles our infrastructure is. So we used to offer space on the Meetup platform for free for organizing, but that might not be the right one to use. And I actually don't even really use Meetup anymore. So I, I think what would be helpful, uh, our diversity and inclusion group, if you were to contact them, or even I can grab your email and we can have a conversation about this, what are the unique challenges you're facing? What, what platform do you all like to use to organize? Also, doing online organizing is always an option, and I think it's something that is getting better now that we've kind of gone through this whole time of being through the pandemic. And then also for the grants, 
we actually have on python.org under PSF, there's a whole guide there about how to apply for a grant. But if it's still a little unclear, happy to talk to you about kind of how that works. What we, what we require is actually like an itemized budget, even if it's not like to the, like the exact cent, just kind of understanding how you're using your money because we have to do reporting on how we give money out. That's, that's really impactful for us. And that's generally like the thing that sometimes may help us give you more money or ask more clarifying questions. But yeah, I think, that, I think those points and then we can have a chat after. Uh, my question is about uh, non non foundation. They supporting directly to uh, developers. Uh, you are supporting uh, end users. Yes. So, do you have uh, any uh, co relationship or, in or independently working? Ah, uh, okay. I think is the question about how do we support the actual developers instead of end yes. users? Good question. So, we actually have hired a. Core Python in resident, uh, core Python developer in residence, which is a, that was a big part of fundraising was to make sure we could do that. So we have one of those. We're trying to expand the money we give to core Python developers, and part of that survey that we're doing every year, uh, well, actually, it's been like every two or three years. Uh, we're trying to use that to see what the trends are. One thing that we have not quite figured out is. Do we do a Python certificate for training? It's kind of, it, that one's a little challenging. Python in education's huge. We're still trying to figure that one out, but we're doing a pilot program with some universities in the United States. So if there's unique challenges that the Japanese community is facing, I would love to hear about it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, two, two people. Sorry, uh, we have a uh, time limit, so ne next is the last one, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks for really, really great presentation. Um, I'm an organizer of the Django community in Japan. Oh, and fantastic. Yeah, and the PSF uh, gave us a grant for year event. Really, thank you. Uh, and my question is that when we uh, hold the event, yeah. uh, it's difficult to promote, especially for new people. Right, and right. It's there is a so big uh, mental barrier to come to the new place, like right, a new event. Right. Uh, especially the after COVID-19. So how do you tell people to come uh, event, especially for the new people? Yeah, I, I can personally say one of the things that I have done, at least in my area, I, I actually go and speak a lot at universities. It's very taxing. We all are volunteers. We don't get paid for this. But a person I think that could be really helpful, specifically with the Django community, uh, Jeff Triplett is a, a current director, and he helps organize the DjangoCon US. Mm -hmm. So I think he would be a really good person for you to connect with. I can pass his information to you. Already, thank you. Yeah, of thank course. You. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Arigato. Thank you.